Hello and welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soil podcast. I am your host, Kate Cavanaugh, and together we are laying the groundwork for generations to come. One of the things I've really loved about this spate of podcasts at the beginning of the year is that they're very focused on history. And as we focus on biology and regenerative agriculture and nutrition and spirituality even and and sort of the art of what it is to be human... This has been a new exploration for me, and this episode is no different. I was so excited to dig in with Brian Sanders, who you might know as Food Lies on Instagram, or maybe you've seen hints of his upcoming documentary with the same title, Food Lies, really exposing the machinations of how our food system ended up where we did. And last week we had on James Connolly, and I think in a lot of ways, he ended up laying a lot of the groundwork for this conversation. And this conversation is going to build on a lot of these historical themes. And one of the things, and I didn't plan this, that is most fascinating to me is that they don't overlap, but they very much really create this whole picture of the recent history in the last 150 years of how our current food paradigm really came into existence. And I think that this is incredibly important for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it's really important to kind of consider how we got here because in having all of these conversations about how we how we might shift the paradigm and how we might create alternative systems it's important to understand the foibles of what has happened and i think it's also important to understand what we're up against and so that's kind of that second point is that This behemoth, what Anthony Gustin called while he was on this podcast, the corporate organism that has been created is is something that we have to understand and I think understand as as much as possible. And so these these two episodes really give us a lot of historical context for how our food and healthcare system really got to where they are. And I'm just I'm so excited to bring you these. And I think In particular, this episode with Brian was really exciting. Number one, Brian Sanders and his podcast Peak Human is prolific. He's had incredible guests on and absorbed so much of their knowledge. His lines of inquiry are really fantastic as he explores this through the limbs of the Food Lies documentary. And he's he's really digging deep. Here on this podcast, him and I were kind of live troubleshooting some ideas. Like we were drawing some conclusions together as we were moving through the conversation. And that's the real magic of podcasting to me is that I can lay out this outline for a conversation and sometimes it goes that way and sometimes it goes completely differently. And sometimes there's really a meeting in the middle where a conversation happens and some real salient points start to get created in real time and this is this is one of those podcasts which makes it a a really big gift so i encourage you all to give it a good listen through we definitely cover a wide gamut of a lot of different topics and i think everything really comes together at the end and i can't wait to hear your thoughts please let me know Before we get started, we just have a couple of accounting things to cover together, and one of them is a conference called What Good Shall I Do? put on by the folks at Force of Nature Meets. Now, I'm not a fangirl, and Force of Nature invited me down to do a butchery demo with them at the beginning of December, which we'll talk more about in an upcoming episode, but I went in without many expectations, which is often how I go into things. And what I found was just the most stunning 
wonderful, warm, welcoming, knowledgeable group of people I think I have ever encountered. And I instantly became a fangirl of of this group of humans that is putting together Force of Nature meets. And if you've seen them online or in the grocery store, they have really fantastic ground meats with organ blends. Uh, they are doing a lot of good work for ground meat. And I am very passionate about that. But they put on a conference and this year is their second annual conference. And it is a really incredible space to explore the community above ground as well as the community below ground that exists in the soil and to really access Mother Nature's capacity for healing. And it's going to be ranchers and nutritionists and consumers and biologists, everybody coming together to really talk about this space, really, that we're all in and that we're all interested in here at Mind, Body, and Soil together. And, you know, I'm going to be speaking, so that's a pretty pretty motivating reason to be there as well as giving a butchery demo with my husband Josh but Ann Bickley who was a guest on the podcast um is going to be there Judith Schwartz Joel Salatin Kelly Levesque like there is just a really fantastic lineup here and so we'll have a link to that below I don't make any money off of this I just actually am really encouraging everybody to come and partake in community if you've been on the fence about this event now is the time Um, and so this is this is just my little public service announcement and our next bit is just Hey, we're here. We've switched over from the Groundwork podcast to the Mind, Body, and Soil podcast. And I am so excited for this year's slate of guests. We have some incredible people coming up. And I just want to take a moment and thank you for listening over the last nine months and for being here for the evolution into the Mind, Body, and Soil. We're going to be exploring even more with some incredible guests as well as just with me. And if the show is resonating with you, if you could just hit subscribe and maybe drop a rating and review in Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen, so that other listeners can can find this podcast. It's just a little act of reciprocity in this space. And I really appreciate it. Okay. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Let's dig into this incredible episode with Brian Sanders of the Peak Human podcast, of Food Lies documentary and Instagram, and the Sapien Center down in Austin, as well as Nose to Tail, where you can get all kinds of amazing regeneratively raised, grass-fed, ground meats, and so much more. Let's go. Hi, Brian. It's just such a pleasure to be here with you today. Hello. I'm so glad to be here, Kate. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I, I really thought a lot about this interview and really exploring how food makes us human. And I wanted to start us off with talking about your human journey with food and what brought you to this place. Yeah, it's been a nine year journey for me. I kind of got woken up when I turned 30 and I lost my parents around that same time. And it was also when I turned 30 and I couldn't eat whatever I wanted anymore. And I got by for a a long time. I think a lot of people get by, especially because I was an athlete my whole life and always playing sports and active. So you kind of can stay relatively thin and relatively in shape. But I was just getting all these problems that people get as they age. And I thought it was normal, you know, I thought it was normal to have indigestion, heartburn and joint problems and just all kinds of things and allergies. I'd had allergies my whole life and all these little things that, and just getting a dad bod and all these kinds of things. And then I changed my diet, which we can get into later, but everything changed. I I just made a simple (laughs) switch in my diet. Every, all those problems went away. My allergies went away that I've had my whole life. They can come back. If I eat A piece of bread, even if it's sourdough, I'll have allergies the next day. I'm just finding that out. I have like the last remnants of little allergies from Thanksgiving. 
weekend. It's in, it's incredible how much just just a little bit off will shift everything. I experience that all the time in my my diet, and I'll venture just a little bit off the beaten path and find these downstream effects that surprise me. It's crazy, and then I realize that oh wait, that's people just don't even know that they feel off or sick or halfway, you know, fifty sixty percent their whole life, because I was that. I was just going down this road where. I was just going to get worse and worse. I was going to get on medications, I'm sure. And I would just have never have known. So I don't, yeah, I don't take any over-the-counter medications. I don't take any other medications. I just don't see a doctor. Everything's changed in the last nine years. And part of that story is my parents, like I said, yeah. cancer, Alzheimer's. Uh, that was a big wake-up call. How do I not fall to the same fate? And yeah. I, I looked at what they did, especially retrospectively now that I know more. And it, it was confusing because they followed all the right things. They followed the government guidelines. They followed the food pyramid. It's it's amazing. People say, oh, no one follows the food pyramid. I'm like, oh, absolutely. This is just common knowledge. Every It goes – it's not like people look up the food pyramid and then post it on their fridge. But it's – you learn about it in school. All of the doctors repeat it. Everything in society just – is built around it and we were eating seven to eleven servings of whole grains we we're doing we we're cooking our own food doing all that stuff you know low fat products lean chicken avoiding red meat mm -hmm. everything everything that the food birds said we did the fruits and vegetables absolutely everything didn't go out to eat it was a huge treat to go out to eat yet they still ended up with these problems of and i think cancer and alzheimer's are very very diet related maybe not absolutely all of them. Right. Yeah. But so, I mean, people listening probably know this, but if you just, you know, talk to a random person off the street, they'd be like, oh, well, that's just genetic. And I'm saying absolutely not. Absolutely not. There, there's more. There's way more to it, as you know, and we can get into that stuff, too. But I, I wanted to figure out how I could change my diet and lifestyle so that I even if I did have certain you know, genetics that I wouldn't express those genes and I would not have those problems. Mm -hmm. And so far, it's looking like all that stuff is working out. So that's my origin story. I love your origin story. And I've listened to you talk about this on a couple of other podcasts. And I wonder if I might ask you a personal question that you can kind of beg off if you don't want to answer it. But we've been talking a lot about grief on this podcast and its ability to transform the roads that we take in our life. And I feel like you have this real crossroads with your parents passing and it changing your trajectory from mechanical engineer into this whole world of food and nutrition. Yeah, it was a huge change in my life, but I don't know if I've even dealt with this grief yet. And I, yeah, I haven't really talked about it <laughs> publicly, but I, I'm not afraid to talk about it. I actually went to some sort of wellness event last weekend in Austin and, and first started talking about stuff. It was very interesting to to share with other people these things about my family and that I, I never do address maybe. And, and I told them, you know, I've never been to a therapist. I've never talked to anyone about any of this stuff. And they were all just like, you need to, this, it's very effective. It's, it's very powerful. And maybe, I, maybe I still need to do something, but I guess my way of dealing with it was to go down this path and dedicate my life to this. And yeah. just, I really just quit all that whole world after mechanical engineering i got into tech and i learned a lot about you know design and tech and all this stuff that helped me but i could have you know just had a six-figure salary and gone on with my life but instead i said let's do this let's make a film uh, the documentary is called food lies it's been six years in the making and that's what set me down this path and that yeah i guess that's what it been consuming my life is this health stuff it's it's yeah. what I do from when I wake up until I go to sleep. <laughs> and <laughs> Me I too. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I've put other things aside. I've put relationships aside. I've put all kinds of stuff aside just to do this. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you because this is this is big work. Um, I want to get into this. And I, as I was going through your work, the thing that really stands out to me is how often you reference human. And whether it's your podcast, Peak Human, or your new Sapien Community Center, there are these references back to being human. And of course, Sapien meaning wisdom or wise or um, one who knows. Uh, I wanted to dive into this 
human relationship to food, I think a lot about how our relationship to food is really what makes us human. Whether you take an evolutionary stance and you look at how eating meat changed our brain capacity, or you look at how the dawn of agriculture 10,000 years ago began to shift what it meant to be human and got into the realms of socio-political things with food. That food was really a driver for for wars, for taxes, for ways of moving across the planet. And so I'd, I'd love to look through your lens of what is this relationship between being human and food? Yes, it's such a big story. And I learned a lot along the way from some great people, especially Dr. Bill Schindler, give him a shout out. He's a he's an anthropologist, archaeologist, food scientist, author, you know, he's been on my show a couple times, he's in the film. But he taught me that the story of human being human is food. Like they are one <laughs> and the same. It's like every technology that we developed up until, you know, more recently has been revolved around food. Almost everything. Even the wheel is probably, how do we carry food better? <laughs> you know, yeah. everything we've developed is around food. And he, he, he studies this. He's obsessed with it. You should have him on your show. He will tell you all about that it's either about acquiring food or preparing food. <laughs> that, that is every technology that we, humans have developed really until you know whatever year. And it's either a hunting technology. What are the first technologies? Just hunting. Right. It's um, and then with the plant foods, it's about acquiring, gathering. It's about detoxifying plant foods. He gets really into all the measures that ancient cultures and modern cultures that still do traditional methods use to prepare the foods properly. I mentioned sourdough as mm -hmm. the correct way to eat bread. And no one eats like the real sourdough these days. Stuff in the store is fake. It just has citric acid in it to make it taste sour. It's not actually fermented, you know, and. Stuff like this. So I didn't, yeah, I didn't know anything. I didn't know that until I heard you say that on a podcast, and I was like, oh, yeah, okay. And no wonder everyone's having problems with bread, you know? I still don't eat bread, even if it is sourdough, because I found it still doesn't work, and then you can get into the gut microbiome and all <laughs> kinds of gut stuff and how that's probably the center of all disease is, you know, how our gut interacts with food. And it makes sense, too. It's like what interacts with the world. It's like your GI tract is open to the outside world, and food – contacts at the most you're eating kilogram quantities of food every day and people are just like eh, calories a calorie <laughs> does it you know yeah it's just about eating fewer calories like you're insane this is your entire body is interacting with this food on a daily basis and it's i mean just think of the surface area alone yes i wish i had these quotes of like how you know like the small intestine it's like tennis, court. tennis courts yeah, I, I think it's a full tennis court, the small intestine. And this is I mean, it's an elegant conversation that's happening between our environment and our biology through the medium of food. And there is this deep intimacy of what you're talking about, that our GI tract is open to the outside world, that that is still the outside of our body. And here we are taking in food and it's interacting and all of its chemicals. If we're talking about bread, we're usually talking about glyphosate and it's sending and relaying information about what time of year it is and where we are. And It's a huge rabbit hole that I don't know if anyone has figured out yet, right? All this stuff with the gut and we're, we're getting more into it now and we're realizing like leaky gut or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and all these things where you, the, these tight junctions in of our membranes of our you know intestines are opening up because of mm -hmm. these different foods and how we've modified these grains and whether it be the the glyphosate we put on it or just the the amount of gluten that we've bred into these new types of grains so that they're bigger and hardier and you know all these things that have helped us get more food but yeah to go back a little more into the the food story you mentioned so many other things that it's shaped society. And we are covering this in the film, and I, I think it's really interesting uh, to look back at how we got here and how do we how did we get to this crazy world that we're in now with yeah. the, f the crazy food system and people, normal people eating 80% of their diet from processed foods and, and just how, how do we get this? And big pharma, sick care system, all this stuff is guided by food. And it 
does go back to when we first domesticated grains. Actually, it's it's also to do with the processing and, and profits in the processing, and that's something that I think we'll mention a lot today because I learned more about it, and I'm sure you've learned about it trying to sell well-raised meat <laughs> and that there's no profit margin. No. Like, it, it's insane. Yeah, I mean, I'm about to end my relationship with some of these ranchers because I can't make any money trying to sell good meat to people. Yeah. And that's when I realized how much the processing matters and how much the, like if you take the cheapest ingredients possible and the most abundant ingredients and the unhealthy ingredients, which is the refined grains, the seed oils and added sugar. It's like these three things make up again, I'll throw out a number 80% of foods of processed foods. And they're the cheapest three ingredients are the most shelf stable and they are the worst for us. And that's how people make money. And if you wanted to make money, you could just start some company instead of a good regenerative meat company, you could start some bar. It's like, Oh, I'm gonna make a keto bar and it's going to have, you know, all these cheap ingredients. It's going to cost like $3 a bar. It's going to cost like 28 cents to make. And then there's a huge profit margin. And then we can do some advertising. We could do all kinds of things. And then I just really put it all together. This is, okay. So this is how the world works. This is why the same like eight companies own the entire food system and why they can fund anything they want, do lobbying, do whatever they can to keep the systems the same. I want to tease something out because this was actually on my list to talk to you about, you know, I own a whole animal butcher shop and we've been in business for 10 years and we only source whole animals and it's all regenerative and grass fed and you own eat nose to tail and you're helping bring regenerative ranchers to people's doorsteps and there is no financial incentive to do so and in fact i think it's incredibly difficult to make it work and i know that we have held on by the skin of our teeth as a business over the last 10 years and I, I'm sure we'll get into this more in the podcast, but financial incentive, I think, is what has driven a lot of where we are today in food. And it's interesting to look at it from the opposite lens of trying to do the best thing and having it be incredibly difficult. Well, now I know why no one does it. And even <laughs> people in the space, I'm trying to, you know, not go bankrupt. I'm trying to actually just support myself so to make the film. Right. Yeah. And, and I, all I want to do is make the film, do podcasts and, you know, do content on this to wake people up. And so I need to obviously pay my rent and bills. And now I realize why everyone else in the space made, I don't know, liver pills, like mm -hmm. highly processed product. I'm not I'm not against them and I'm friends with those guys, but it's like it's something that costs fifty four dollars mm -hmm. and it's like a ground up liver that could cost you one dollar. Yes. So I, I get it now. And to, to tie up what I was saying before, going back into history, I, I always love to go talk about the Egyptian days. You know, that's when this, this first kind of power structures even developed and shaped society where people could tax and store these products and accumulate wealth. And that was the first time that we went away from the more egalitarian societies where people were almost pretty equal and we had you know hunter gatherer tribes of different sizes and maybe there you know there were, were, were surely some sort of different hierarchies but nothing compared to what happened when we process all the grains and tax them and stored them and so there's the pharaohs and then there's the peasants and there wasn't many people in between and when i look at society today it's actually pretty much the same and yeah. people don't really realize it you know it's kind of when you pop out of the matrix i feel like a lot of people have been coming out of the matrix in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it, you know, getting red pills. It's the same thing, right? You take the red pill instead of the blue pill. Yep. You realize, oh, wait a second. Our world is still in the same power structure of people at the top pulling all the strings and a whole bunch of peasants basically trying to survive. So I don't know if you, how I think you agree. Oh, I agree. I agree completely. And I think that that's, that's a really important lens to look through is that this is that same structure, that hierarchical structure. And I go back to this idea that 
you know, around the same time that Earl Butts was the Secretary of Agriculture in the 70s and said to get big or get out, Henry Kissinger, who's controversial in his own right, but was the Secretary of State. And he said, control oil and you control nations, control food and you control people. And I think that when you look at history, whether you're looking at the Egyptians or um, Mark Kurlansky does a beautiful job in his book, Salt, of covering how, how salt was used to control people and taxes, that you see that food was used as a mechanism of control and also of division between classes. And it still is. And it and still it is. Still and is. That's why I think most people listening see this and you know my crowd sees the writing on the wall you know I, I post about this stuff about all you know the fake meat it's the beyond meats but then it goes into the cell derived meats you know the uh, actual uh, grow you know lab grown meat that goes into pushing of bugs mm -hmm. you know and people say oh that you guys are so stupid you guys and your bug conspiracy theories no one's gonna make you eat bugs like I'm not saying that that's happening today or that I mean I think they are. Yeah, I think that it definitely is heading that direction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think they're setting this up. And I, you know, I had Tara Couture on the podcast and we talked about legislation, the way that legislation is going in Canada or New Zealand or Ireland, where they're beginning to tax cattle just from small farmers, from homesteaders even, uh, for their for their climate emissions, that this is all part of moving us towards eating eating bugs, eating more processed food that is making us sicker and is making us more complacent, maybe more sedentary and changing our biology. Like to get back to that first idea that food is what shapes our human organism. I think that it shaped it positively as it, as it helped our brains grow and change us. And now it's having a negative impact on the human organism. All those things plus testosterone for men it's got it's like half of what it was just a yes. few a few decades ago i mean people this is an accident that's what i mm -hmm. found and i'm glad you talked to tara tara's the greatest person ever she's in the ever. film i did the her first i i put her on her first podcast ever five years ago it was amazing i, I found her from instagram and her amazing mm -hmm. nutrient dense meals oh. and and actually, the greatest. Someone asked me recently, "What was the greatest meal of my life?" And I said, "We filmed with Tara Couture three years ago, four, three and a half years ago, and it happened to be on my birthday. And she made me two meals that were like unbelievable. There was no amount of money that could have covered these meals. It, everything was raised by her own hands and from her own land, and it was absolutely incredible. And there was like thirty different." dishes that she you know she's prepared Ugh. anyway life life changing a meal but it goes back to these systems of control around food i mean i guess we're talking to the right crowd where we don't have to sound like conspiracy theorists that this is tactics that have been used to control people forever and like i said it's it's on purpose i think it's like I don't think w once I looked into the simple science of red meat being healthy and having tons of nutrients that are bioavailable and all the things we need to survive. And now there's this big carnivore community that's just showing the world that you could just just eat meat and survive and do amazing and, and be healthy. I'm like, OK, so this is just basic science that this is healthy and the entire world is telling us that it is bad for us. From, from the top down, right? All the powers that be. Now, that's how I know there's something going on. You know, it's yeah. not like, oh, let's look at something. It's like they're, they're trying to say that French fries are healthy. And then we're like, oh, I don't know if French fries are healthy. You know what I mean? It's like, it's so opposite that it has to be rigged. I agree. I'm, I mean, you're taking the most nutrient dense food on the planet and you're vilifying it. And I actually, I have this question for you because one of the things that's been percolating for me, and I think obviously these systems of control around food have been in place throughout history, and we can point at a lot of different points in time. Mm -hmm. But I have this question, you know, as, as your account is called Food Lies and the film is called Food Lies, where does a lie start? And 
One of the things I've really noticed, especially around meat and its vilification in the media, is that while there there was groundwork, whether you're talking about Ansel Keys or whatever it was, there were these kind of these initial things that started us off down the road, maybe. Um, but then it gets parroted and people stop using their own judgment and looking at these these truths these truths, and this is in quotation marks, these truths about food and really reconciling it with their own, through their own logic, through their own common sense. And it just gets parroted over and over again. And so there's this question of what is the engine driving the lies in the food system? Like, how do these lies start? Yeah, you're right. What There was a, like a foundation of lies that with Ansel Keys and there's this whole era in the 50s and 60s where it all started and you know we covered that in the film and then they're perpetuated then they get into the medical books and then you know it's, it takes generations to undo that basically mm -hmm. and maybe we're seeing a little bit of that being undone lately but I think it, it starts way before that uh, so I got red pills even more in the past three years and I started to look back and kind of understand more about how the world works. And I kind of realize more about that there, there aren't any accidents, that everything is headed in the same direction. Like with the, the climate stuff mixed with, the, which, which gets into the, the carbon credits and con, like there's so yeah. much that that touches. I don't know if people understand how, how big of a tactic the climate stuff is. And sure, no one wants to ruin the climate. Or you know what I mean? I mean, completely separate things. Like, yes, of course we're not we don't want to just pollute the world. We're just gonna have factories polluting everything. We're just gonna have like factory farms just like just having run off. You know, we don't obviously want that, but people don't understand what a, what a tool, how big a tool this was. And I actually just was watching videos on this last night about climate scientists speaking out on it. She was kicked out of, you know, all of her academic jobs and system and she had to go off on her own because she's not following the narrative and she says the same thing yeah of course we're not advocating for just destroying the planet and just doing you know terrible practices but this is not at all what it seems to be this is a t tactic a tool for control mm -hmm. to centralize power and this stuff started in before even before i'll just go back to 1980s because that's what this certain woman was talking about it's like there wasn't even a big like sea level rise or CO2 problem, whatever they're trying to say that happened in 1980. Yet they already had meetings and policies about this and on the world scale, we're talking the UN and you know the WHO and these big <laughs> figures to start implementing these things because they understood that if we can use this giant looming destruction of the world as a tool, we can gain power and centralize systems and govern the world on the world level and they and yeah I, I like to watch these videos of people talking about this stuff about the, the people admitting that there was you know world government goals and you know people like to call these conspiracy theories the new world order or the great reset is the new thing this is not a conspiracy this is happening right in front of us and it's been documented and there's great books about this and there's so many tangents we can go on even with the medicine side Rockefeller medicine. I don't know if you've oh. heard about this. There's like a whole kind of documentary on that on how the Rockefellers shaped the medical system into the sick care system and how this was purposefully, this was all documented by certain people that, you know, no one knows about this unless you dig around that this sick care system we have was by design that they, the, the Rockefeller group and, you know, some others realized the potential of pharmaceutical drugs and petroleum-based drugs and surgeries for money-making. And they pretty much stamped out any natural healers. And they basically coined the term quack. Like quackery. Call Interesting. Quack. quack, yeah, that was a propaganda technique. It was actually invented as a way to, to discredit any natural healing methods or natural doctors. And it survives today. I... And I think there's something interesting in everything that you're saying, too, is that one of the things that I think is incredibly insidious about the way that that this has been 
I'm going to, I'm going to say orchestrated Mm -hmm. is that it's changed our beliefs about what it is to be human, right? That we believe. And I think that this is the narrative that's being fed to us, that we are a scourge on the earth. And this is the fault of the individual that climate change is, is on you. If you would just drive an electric car, which I mean, that that's a whole, that's a whole uh, Pandora's yeah. box we could open, um, or uh, eat less meat or yeah. stop using straws, then all of this could change when, you know, if that's happening, it, it's happening at the corporate level, not at the individual level. And so there's this big, like they have shifted our beliefs that we don't belong here on earth as humans, that we're not a part of the environment. There's this constant separating of us from nature, from the environment and, and increasing that schism. Yes. Yes. And that's what I found. And the more you look into it, the more you see it. And then it becomes clear that, like I said, none of this was an accident that they are trying to push us away from understanding where our food is from, push us away from, you know, growing our own food. That solution is always, let's do it for you. We, we have it under control. We're going to give you the processed food, the, the new soy burgers or the, the milk alternatives. We have the solution. Another thing I like to say is how I know it's all fake is that their solutions always skip the, the real solution and go straight to something they can make money on. So it's like, oh, feedlots are bad. Completely skip regenerative ag. The stuff, you know, oh. completely skip over. So they never talk about things that we've been doing forever. And they'll just be like, so this, so feedlots bad, soy burger is good, right? They completely skipped it to something that they sell. And this is always the case. It's the same thing we're saying. Blaming it on the in- individual is a huge tactic. It's like there's these subversion tactics that are used to like control societies at large. And, th- and yes, if, if, if it's you, you're the problem, you skip the solution, right? Skipping the solution of going back to being a human, like living closer to the land, closer to how your food is grown and just, you can't use straws or you have to drink fake milk, right? It, it always yeah. skips a problem into something mm-hmm. they're selling. I think that's really, that's a really salient point. I, mm-hmm. I love that you pointed that out. And I, I want to pull the sick care system back into it because I think that it's vertical integration at its worst, right? It's the, it's the idea that if you make a corn chip, if a corn chip company and an anti-diarrheal medication are owned by the same parent company, then what if they were inclined to make the corn chips give you diarrhea, right? That, that you are then going to be dependent. And if you create a food system that is making people sick, and then you offer the solution in the form of pharmaceutical drugs, sounds like a pretty good system to me from a profit standpoint. It's genius. It's genius. I'm actually going to post something today. Someone sent me a video. It's like some stupid like TikTok video, but it's really good. Or Instagram video. It's, it's do you want to be part of the solution or part of the problem. Why not both? And it's Bayer Monsanto, right? And it, it was a little, there's a more to it, but Bayer <laughs> Monsanto, well, they're the same company now. They, yep. uh, you know, who acquired who, but uh, that's exactly what's going on. And it's our entire world works like that. You can look at any system and it'll be like that. And, and I love to get into this stuff. It's like, why is our education system like this? Why is it so bad? Why is it just pumping out people who, who can't think critically, who just are following the same narrative, who are canceling each other, all this stuff. Then I read the book, Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. And Mm. this woman, Charlotte Iserby, researched this from the early 1900s. And again, this is not like a fictional book or narrative book. It's just documented quotes and excerpts of this education system being shaped in a certain way. And she goes back to 1900 and it's like, she talks about how they just wanted basically worker bees. They wanted people to not critically think, and they were successful. Well, I, I read the first half of this book, and it blew my mind. And, and, and I'm thinking about the people, same groups of people, these huge tycoons, you know, the Rockefellers and the, all these people you've heard of with all the money that had all the oil and the, the steel money back in the beginning of, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, shaped this to their advantage and how successful it was 
that I think about how our education system is now, especially our universities that are just oh yeah, so I don't know. I I don't want to get political, but they they would be rolling in their grave if they saw what was going on today. Because yeah. they would never have, or actually, I would say they'd be laughing. I mean, I mean, they would be yeah. cackling at the success of what they put. Just read some of this book. You can get it on online for free. It's a free PDF. It's hard to read like a free, like some, it's very dry <laughs> reading, but it's amazing. They're like, this is what was set up. This is not an accident. This is designed to create worker bees. It's called Skinnerian Tactics, which is how you train a dog, which is basically like get a treat for doing something and just memorizing things essentially. And just all, so much can be learned from history. And, and we got onto this topic because you asked about the, like when did the lies start mm -hmm. and it definitely wasn't Einzel keys you know that's when in the 50s and 60s eisenhower had a heart attack and the, and you know the whole thing was okay what are we going to do what's the heart disease was just becoming a problem actually what was the problem people were smoking and and just the the seed oil so the the margarine the crisco all this stuff just came out in the 1918 somewhere around then mm -hmm. and it just became a big part of the diet in the 40s 50s Right. This is what the first wave of disease coming from the hydrogenated oils and Crisco's and margarines and all that. Plus smoking. Everyone, you know, seen the clips of yeah. those days. They're like smoking in a car, smoking in the elevator, smoking in their baby's room. And <laughs> and then they're wondering why there's heart disease. So that I mean, the, the big lie started way before that. And again, if in every system, like I said, food system, the education system, the banking system. If you want to look into that, look mm -hmm. into the Federal Reserve and how that was <laughs> created and how oh, yeah. that is not part of the government. That was like basically hijacked. And I, I need to get my years right. Maybe it was 1914. Uh, this group. I of think bankers, it was 1917. 1917. Jekyll Island. Jekyll Island. This group of bankers t hijacked the system. Basically, they're so powerful that they could take over, basically just take over Congress. This all happened also during Christmas. It was like, it was this whole thing when um, people were out of town and away and they like kind of passed through this law and took the Federal Reserve out from the government and made it, it's basically a private institution that controls the whole monetary system. So mm -hmm. you have the monetary system, you have the education system, which you know you can read about and see how that was controlled. We have the food and the farming and then the pharmaceutical system. And you can you look into the, you know, the Rockefeller stuff and Rockefeller medicine, if you search that uh, <coughs> keyword, it might be hard to find. Maybe we can link to it. But I then you realize something. that every system is just controlled fr from it. I think it started in, the, I don't know how far back you can go. Definitely the late 1800s, the early 1900s, a lot of this stuff started. And again, not an accident. It was designed and orchestrated. And I and one reason, the simple way to kind of know this is it always went in their favor. If you could think of, anything, you take anything and then say, would it go this way or would it go that way? If it was just by chance, it should all, it should go, you know, either side, but 100% of them go to big centralization side, right? Every time it goes to the right side that they want. Yeah. And you have this perfect storm. And I mean, when you put it together like that and you pull in these pieces, you pull in the education system. I had on a, a guest, his name is Will Roosh. He's a, he's a high school teacher out in LA and, and really big into heterodox thinking and really teaching kids how to be curious, not, mm -hmm. not teaching them what to think, but teaching them how to think. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we've really missed in our education system. And here we find ourselves sick, obese, uh, testosterone at a precipitous decline and the system has been set up for for failure for centralization and I, I I'm honestly a little bit at a loss for words because as you as you speak about skipping that step I I see mm -hmm. something that I hadn't really seen before that we're constantly skipping over what feels like the next logical step in favor of feeding profits. And I think that while it might have started in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the groundwork was laid for that historically. I mean, when we're talking about the the 
withholding and taxation of salt, or we're talking about grains in, in Egypt being a part of the diet of slaves and very profitable. The basis for that is there. It is. It is. And when you once you kind of realize this is how the world works, it's it's kind of sad and it, it hurts you and you, you try, you're trying to figure out what to do about it. And it's really hard because you have to go against these huge systems and huge powers. But the, the really the answer always is to go away from the centralization. It's always going away from this new system they want to set up to being human again. And that is a tagline. Speaking of Dr. Bill Schindler, I mean, his tagline is eat like a human again. You know, but it's like everything is just that answer is to do it how our ancient ancestors did it. And not that I am, you know, I, I think some people make fun of people who are into ancestral diets or looking to the past because they're just like, oh, yeah, we're going to just go wear a loincloth and go in a cave, <laughs> you know, and they try to minimize it. But it obviously, we're not saying that. Obviously, we're saying there's a way to do both and live in a modern society, but look to the past for the solutions. And it's look to the decentralized method of, any, of everything would be the solution or the just the more what's good for the individual is not good for the powers that be. Or right? if you think of all these things, it, it's actually a bigger topic that I, I'm still getting my head around is the greater good. The concept of the greater good is a weapon that's used against us. It was used against us in the past three years. Mm -hmm. Everything that was, it, it was supposed to be done under the guise of greater good. Climate change, you have to do it for the greater good. Mm -hmm. You know, eat, eat this rice and beans instead of meat for the greater good. Everything and take this pharmaceutical drug for the greater good for the greater good and it but you have to just look at what's good for the mat. I mean, it's a weapon because you could easily think, yeah, but it is for the greater good or I should think about my neighbors. You can't get caught up in that thinking. You have to think of your like the opposite is usually what's better for the individual and by serving individuals health and wellness and well-being in your family and friends you can affect the greater good by being healthier so this <laughs> this is a uh, hopefully this makes sense I, I love to talk about how, how to feed the world a great friend um dr oh he's from he's from Tans tasmania he's from uh what is that gary fetke i don't know if you come across this guy dr gary fetke he looked into the beginning of veganism and why, how it, it came about, and he, he traced it back to the late 1800s with a woman, Ellen G. White, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's an amazing story. So listen to my podcast with him. It's F-E-T-T-K-E, okay, Gary Fecky. But he, people always ask, okay, so how do we feed the world, right? You're into regenerative ag. You're into eating local, seasonal foods, whole foods, all that. How do you do that? He said, you can't think about feeding the world. No one can think that big. You think you feed your community, and by default, you fed the world. Yes. Think, think about that. If every community fed themselves, you would have just fed the world. Yes. Right? You can't, like, when you start thinking about feeding the world on a mass scale, you're screwed. Then you send sacks of grains to Africa. That's not how you feed the world. Sending sacks of grains to Africa is what we try to do in the 90s. The, I don't know if you remember that. There was, like, commercials for, you know, at, on TV to, you know, send you know, for a dollar a day, you can feed this. That was a nightmare. It's basically just pumping Monsanto, like GMO grains and all these different things that screwed them, right? It screwed yes. them. I it's have crazy. a, I, in this feed the world category, I have a butcher friend in South Africa. And I, I don't know if people know this, but we send a lot of our chicken hindquarters across the world because we only boneless, skinless chicken breasts here mm -hmm. in the United States not saying the listeners of this show, but mm -hmm. as a general rule of thumb. And she had this whole saying, like, we're full. Thank you. And, and while that's not true, ostensibly from, from what people are experiencing, we have to build local communities. This global food system has proven that it doesn't work on multiple different levels, but it's incentivized by corporate profits or what Anthony Gustin called the corporate organism mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on a different episode of this show. Yeah, I love Anthony. We were talking about him before the show. <laughs> I'm here in Austin. But it is. And 
we're full. So I, I've heard of so many of these stories of even shoes. They're like, oh, let's get all these shoes to Africa or these poor countries. That just disrupted the entire bit, their economy, and it put all these shoemakers out of business. You know, there's all these unintended consequences. And yes. I don't know if there's a video on this or, or some more information somewhere, but you can look it up. And it's amazing. You're like, oh, yeah, of course. Right? These poor people, they're trying to make a living making their own shoes, and they, they, they were doing okay and getting their fellow community shoes. It's like what happened is all these other food – well, to tie in the food thing is all these cheap grains came in for free, <laughs> right? They got dropped off there. That ruins their farming system. People, you know, now had cheaper or free grains and then they could spend money elsewhere. It screwed up everything. And then they, they needed to get free shoes. You know what I mean? They were doing fine before when they were making their own food, making their own shoes. When big interest came in, it screwed everything up. And so I, I got on this tangent because if, to feed the world, you feed your community. You don't just start at the top and try to do it on the way down. And it's the same thing that this greater good notion is being used against us, like mm -hmm. I said, health-wise, COVID stuff, climate change, whatever it is, you got to think about it differently. Think about it as how can I help the individual, myself, my friends, my family, my community. If I get myself healthy, if I don't spend a t ton of money on health care, because I am eating the right foods and have a good lifestyle. And, you know, all these things that you can do to help yourself is for the greater good. I have no burden on the healthcare system because I don't use the healthcare system. That could be saving millions of dollars over the course of my life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So. I mean, in a, we live in the United States where healthcare spending sits just below $4 trillion per year. What would that change? You know, with like single everyone, diabetes, patient yeah. is fourteen thousand dollars per year in the healthcare system. But if every diabetes patient realized, or they were even told that they could reverse their diabetes, their type two diabetes, yeah. with diet and lifestyle, then maybe some of them would. Or what <laughs> if we focus on that? What if we spent half that amount to give them programs and guides to actually do that? I. I the world would be completely different, but of course that's never going to happen. And that doesn't profit the powers that be. And they're just going to be like type two diabetes is a slow progressive disease. There's no curing it. Mm -hmm. Just take more insulin. You'll be on more insulin for the rest of your life. There's no proven way to reverse type two diabetes yet. All the doctors I know are doing that on a daily basis with yes. simple dietary changes and lifestyle changes. Yes. Okay, so we find this, ourselves at this point where we're sick, we're indoctrinated and dependent on systems that were designed to make us dependent on them and centralized. And we want to get back to living a more ancestral human lifestyle, living like a human within the context of modern society and decentralizing. What, what do we do? Well, you could take each topic separately. For the food part, people already know, if they've listened to your show before, or know anything about you or I, you know, if you go to local ranchers, yeah. right? You find people w using regenerative methods and you buy it straight from them. I tell people, you don't have to order it on nose to tail. You can also just go, you know, even use your site where you can find yep. Where, where they're located near you. I tell people to go to westonprice.org. They have a, a tool where you can find ranchers in every state and mil, you know, raw milk and all these resources. Mm -hmm. Go to, I tell people all the time. I would lived in LA for so many years of my life, concrete jungle, yet there was four farmer's markets that I could bike to, <laughs> right? Like this is, you have no excuse really. So with the, the food stuff, you just need to, to go, just be simple again. I have a little story because I was Thanksgiving weekend, you know, visit some friends of family of friends of family. There was some distant connection. I was in <laughs> Arkansas of all places. And these people were like gluten free, like, oh, I'm gluten free. I'm a nutritionist. And they were all they're eating is highly processed products. And everything was gluten free. And it was bags and bags of fake breads with 30 ingredients and all this stuff like you. And they were not doing well. They're sick all the time. No. You know, it was this whole story like why we're sick for like the eighth time in the past three months. It was insane. So I'm like, okay, you need to get simple. We need, to, don't, yes, gluten free is a good idea. Instead of getting all the processed alternatives, just don't eat the bread. 
who needs it? Like, why don't you just eat real food? So, that, I mean, you can get meat, you can get eggs, you get vegetables, you can get fruit. You're done. Like, you don't need anything else. We've, we've not had anything else, if, you know, for most of history. And the, the bread is a whole other story, but, you know, maybe it was raised differently, different systems, different kind of breads, fermented, all this type of stuff. So food, obvious one, is just eat real food, eat animal foods, the, yeah. eat, you know. I don't need to preach to the choir. The the other stuff's a little bit harder because uh, then you have to start <laughs> going into like homeschooling. You know, it's like uh -huh. how do I get out of the system? Well, there's also al alternative schools too. I know they're popping up around here. You you could either do group schools. There's Montessori type schools. There's uh, I forget the other names for them. Right? I don't, do you know any other names? Forest schools. Um... I mean, it, it, it's tough now. It used to be Waldorf. I think that's well, I think that's in a different yeah. situation now, right. depending on what your views are. Mm. Um, uh, but I think that there is a return to that. And I think one of the things that my husband and I talk about, we don't have kids, but we've talked about it. We've talked about schooling is that the way the state education is the experiment, Homeschool is the is the norm. That is what it is to be human: is to raise our children in a in a pack in a community with us, learning on the job, as it were, and and not in state funded education. What's called? I call them government schools now. I, people call them public schools. <laughs> I saw a great meme. It's like there's nothing public. These are not public schools. Mm. They're government schools. Mm, like, mm -hmm. and he just goes through the whole thing. It's like who fund is everything? It's just a government school. So yeah. I know it's hard, but try not to use the government school system. They're only going to pump out what benefits them. Uh, what else is there? There's finance stuff. I'm actually not super sure about Bitcoin. A lot of people think Bitcoin's a solution. Not either. I don't think so. I think it's another kind of tool or weapon that's in disguise. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been some stuff going on lately that's mm. that, well, I don't want to get into the FTX stuff, but I think some of this stuff with the cryptocurrencies it's like a controlled demolition, basically, yeah. to 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 bring in regulations around this stuff, and also to normalize and usher in a central bank digital currency, I CBDC. Agree. And I think this is all coming. So we kind of touched on it earlier about these, like what's gonna the future gonna look like. And I think it's central bank digital currency, right? So it's like this, oh, it's like Bitcoin, but it's like the better one because it's the government. And I'm like, oh, wait, so that's just something that you guys can control. And it's already happening in China and it's been happening for years where they have all these systems like from the social credit score to even just you, even since 2017, they, they got fined. You could, there's so many cameras that if you jaywalk, you just automatically get deducted a certain amount of money. And that started in 2017. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is, I think this is a future. So you have a central bank digital currency. They're like, oh, well, you didn't – well, yeah, you didn't get this certain treatment. You didn't – you know, the, the next pandemic, you didn't mm -hmm. follow the rules. You didn't stay home. You didn't do this or that. Okay, well, now you just can't use your bank account anymore. Or we can just deduct a certain amount of money. Or – the climate thing I think is really going to play into that because they're already starting to do, like you said, there's the taxes on animals. And so pretty soon it's going to be, okay, well, we, we've, we've shown that cows and ruminant animals are bad for the climate and there's a tax on that and you have a limit. So now you've hit your, your carbon quota for the week on red meat and milk yeah. and you can't have any more. And yeah. they have the things in place, which it looks like it's headed to with the, the, the apps and the you know tracking apps, monetary systems, digital currencies, then they can actually control it. Then it's like, okay, well you can't your your card, your your whatever, or your digital money doesn't work on meat products anymore because you've hit <laughs> your quote for the week or the month, your quota. So this stuff is all happening right in front of us, and and you can kind of see it happening as each kind of disaster or emergency that's unfolded. It, it's all always an opportunity to have more control. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people have noticed this, like even like the Patriot Act, it's like 9-11. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there's this huge sweeping list of new laws and yeah. things that have happened. Surveillance. Everything, everything that happens. Yeah. There, it's just an excuse to have more control and more laws and take away freedoms. And so I, it's no conspiracy what's going on. It's, it's heading to this thing of controlling 
what people eat, how they move, how they spend money, and it's based on the guise of greater good and of the climate and of your fellow citizens and don't kill grandma and all this. <laughs> and it's, it's like so obvious. And then to, to the rest of the world, no idea what's going on. Like I talked to my brother back in Hawaii. S everyone in Hawaii is brainwashed. They're stuck in this little island. I'm from Hawaii. Uh, but they, uh, I go back often. I'm like, you guys are just ready and willing to take whatever the government tells you and go along with it. I think sometimes too, though, it's comfortable, right? Like to, to sit on the precipice of what I think is a lot of change within the world and to imagine what it is to go outside of the system. It's uncomfortable. Like it's uncomfortable to think about homeschooling your kids and sourcing all of your food locally and completely overhauling your diet and not tapping into the sick care system and overhauling this belief system that has been purposefully instilled in you. And so I, that is something that I at least like to hold in this is that it's uncomfortable and it's not mm -hmm. easy, especially when we haven't been taught how to think. We've just been taught what to think. Well, you're so right. You're so right. I've thought about this a lot. And I have a great mentor in this, a guy I grew up with in Hawaii, actually, who, who's kind of clued me in because he got red pilled about 17 years ago and has been looking. He's the one that's kind of showed me all these primary sources. He doesn't send me, you know, blog posts or like little memes or Instagram videos. He sends me, you know, firsthand documents mm -hmm. of like what what happened in the last hundred years. And it, it made a lot of sense to me. It's like, OK, if you were, if my brother was to change his views, it would ruin his life. His <laughs> wife doesn't believe in this stuff. He, he would get fired from his job. He, you know, like so many things could happen. It's beyond just comfortable. It's you are stuck in a system and it's it's almost impossible to change your thinking without ruining your life. Yeah. You're and institutionalized and by design. Yeah. And, and then so anyone who thinks differently is labeled conspiracy theorists. So I think just like the quackery thing, it's like the conspiracy theorist, I think, is another big mm -hmm. thing by design. You know, anything that goes outside the system. But then we're like, wait, but that was proven to be true like 10 years later. And you're like, no, you're still a conspiracy theorist. And so it's designed that way. And I can see why people don't want to change. And I know that my brother, I, I try to get through to him a little bit, but then he's just, he'll reject it. It's almost like you're, it's this cognitive dissonance where I can see him start to understand it. And then the next day he's like, yeah, but I have my normal job. I'm my family. Like I'm in this system. And if I start to think that way, like my brother, I will lose everything. I could lose my marriage. I could lose my job. And so then they just snap back into the matrix. I think you said the magic two words here, which is cognitive dissonance. And I think as we talk about a lot about this, that cognitive dissonance keeps coming up. My husband and I, whether we're talking about electric cars and where people think the energy comes from when they plug it into the wall um, or what it takes to mine lithium or whatever piece of that supply chain, or we talk about the sick care system or we talk about some of these quote unquote, you know, what has been deemed conspiracy theories is cognitive dissonance. And it's, it's that inability to, see past the veil and to, to be able to hold it and, and you'll see it and then you'll just kind of push it off by design, by design. And I'm glad that yeah, I did go to a good school in Hawaii actually. Well, now they turn really woke and I don't, I, I wouldn't go there anymore. I used to think it was the best school ever, but they actually taught critical thinking. It sounds kind of like your guest that taught how to think instead of what to think. And, and I think that actually really benefited my life and some people that have come out of the matrix are, I mean a lot of my friends from that school do still have the ability to critically think and it's hard it actually takes maybe years to even mm -hmm. get over that cognitive dissonance and you have to like really step back and like try to unlearn things and unthink the way you've thought and it's not easy and yeah you said uncomfortable a lot of things are uncomfortable. Yeah, changing your diet is, is uncomfortable. No one wants to change. Again, I was with fam a friend's family in Arkansas. The doctor told them, you got to stop eating this food. They, no matter how, you know, it's got the second stent, whatever heart problem, you know what I mean? The whole thing, the guy's not doing well. Won't change. 
will not change. He was sitting there eating pop tarts, and the daughter's yelling at him. I'm like, I, 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 you wanted info from me. I'll give you the info. He won't take it. But what I try to tell people with the, the, the uncomfortable part is, and this is what I try to tell him once you get to the other side, it's just as good, if not better. The change is uncomfortable. Yes, I didn't want to change my diet nine years ago. I loved eating, you know, whatever. It was just like processed foods and delicious snacks and whatever. It was just easy and cheap and packaged, and I thought it was great. And now I realize I hate that food, and I don't like to eat it, and it's it's better. Like I said, it's either the same or better on the other side. It's the change is the hard part. And something with humans, it's like they're so resistant to change because they're like – the dad's just like, well, I mean, I eat pop tarts. I, he was eating pop tarts one day. He had Eggo, the freezer waffles, the other day, because that's just what he does. And I'm like, you realize if you were just eating some bacon and eggs, you would like it more, right? But he, and I know he likes bacon. And you know, I talk about the, this stuff. He's like, you love meat. He's like, I love meat. You, it's like, okay, well, your people have this idea that they're gonna go on a diet. Well, because all the diet advice is wrong. So they have this idea that they're going to go on this diet and it's going to be salads without dressings and rice cakes or I don't know what people deprivation. Eat. Yeah, deprivation and it's going to be plant based and it's going to be gross and they're not going to be full and they're going to be miserable. And I'm like, yeah, that's the normal diet advice. It is terrible and you you will be miserable if you follow it. I'm saying there's a whole different new diet out there of embracing animal foods and just ancestral foods and whole foods and it's delicious and amazing and you're going to love it. You just have to and you're going to feel better and you're going to love amazing. thriving. You're going to love having that vitality. We got to get through that uncomfortable part. And that's the biggest thing to, to try to get people to do. And some people won't do it. If we contextualize this in the what it is to be human and that's come up so much in, in this podcast, what do you think it is about being human that we want to stray away from discomfort? that we want to shy away from it, that we, we don't want to go through it? Or do you think that's a part of being a modern human, that we don't have that exposure to uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. We live in temperature-controlled environments, and we, you know, it's, it's seasonally controlled, and we have these cushy chairs and all of these different things. We don't do a lot of manual labor, I'm pointing at the farm because I mm -hmm. stacked three cords of wood yesterday. We don't have to do these things that are uncomfortable. Do you think it's something about being human or just a modern human? Mm. I think it's, it's half and half. So modern norms, I made a diagram years ago and it was, it started with, it was like a flow chart and it started, I called it modern norms and it flowed from that within eight levels to every single disease and obesity problem we have as a society. And it all stems from modern norms, which is basically eating bad food, convenience foods, this like taking shortcuts, like our modern lifestyle, right? Everything about it is working against us. So I say it's half of that. It's how our modern society is set up is, but the other half is the human nature is to take the path of, path of least resistance. So I think humans are hardwired to do that. And I, I visited Africa actually with Anthony Gustin mm -hmm. and Dr. Paul Saladino. They, they kind of got sick from eating berries with the Hadza and they left yeah. early. <laughs> but I, I, I was there and uh, we crossed paths and then I went on for 17 more days and I, and I learned a lot. And these hunter gatherers, they, they're kind of, they're kind of like us. They're not, they don't, don't want to do work, right? It's not like they want to do hard work. And a lot of their life was really chill. Like I actually said, it, it just seemed like they were on vacation. It's like, what is their life? It's like, well, they were on a permanent vacation. They're hanging out. They're posting up with the homies by the fire. They're playing music and they're singing and talking. And then they'd like go run out and, and hunt for, you know, a couple hours. Maybe sometimes it was three hours, sometimes it was eight hours. And then they'd come home and chill. And like, so humans don't, you know, it's not like they were trying to do work, but they actually, I think throughout history, we found ways where we could get a lot done and not have a lot of effort. And it was a lot of socializing and hanging out and fun and amazing happiness. and. I don't know the study. Have you heard of these studies of 
they looked at modern hunter gatherers and they actually only worked like 20 to 30 hours a week mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. they they actually collected f all the food they needed yeah in 20 to 30 hours and so yeah i think i, I think it's probably way easier back then because another thing i learned is how bad uh the modern hunter gatherers have it because they have no land because the government has pushed them off their land they pushed all the animals onto the game reserves and these these are all you know there to make money they, they make all that it's again it's always a story of the government pushing people off their land to make money so they make tons of money on the game reserves in uganda they make tons of money off of the mountain gorillas and these poor gabatwa these are the pygmies they're pushed out of the forest so they spent their whole existence living in the forest trapping animals and gathering food and you know we, we interviewed this lady this lady was over 100 years old and th so for one they're living in squalor they have no land they have no resources they have no skills and they're living on the edge of this forest where the government makes like 600 dollars per tourist to go on a gorilla tour and so it, it's really bad over there and people may have heard of justin wren he's been on joe rogan's podcast for years talking about making uh, create, uh digging wells and helping the pygmies because they've been kicked off their land and they have nothing and so they so back to the huzzas they're again kicked off their land government making money the whole story and they don't have the big animals they used to have they don't have the land that they used to have so that they could acquire food easily so i guess one thing i'm saying is i think it used to be very easy to acquire food i think we we're very good at it all the technologies we invented uh were around acquiring food and we were good at it and dr bill schindler <coughs> has a great quote in the film that we've already edited about that that we were good at it and we were successful and we didn't get here by scraping by we got no. here by thriving you, yeah. you don't think about having sex or having babies if you're about to die no <laughs> that's the no. last thing you think about you're just trying to survive but no we thrived and we got where we are today because of that and so we used to be good at getting food and we used to have a lot more abundant animals and now these hunter gatherers are still chill relaxed doing great healthier than americans and they even with the bad land they're on and very few animals and they don't have the large animals that we used to have you mentioned something in there that i i really want to tease out as i was thinking about this interview i was thinking about your sapien center in austin mm -hmm. And I was thinking about community as a nutrient, that community is a big part of what makes us human. And in talking about your time with the Hadza, you mentioned something really important. They actually don't work a 40-hour work week or a 60-hour work week or whatever it is that we think of as a work week. And they spend you know, this time hunting and getting food and gathering food and preparing food, but the rest of it is spent in community and in enjoyment. And I think that that is as much a part of what it means to be human, to form these communities, in this case, maybe these decentralized communities that we're talking about throughout this podcast, and to be in that space together, laughing around a fire. It's, it's one of the pillars of being human. I think it's the food, it's, some, it's movement, it's some sort of like outdoors, which you can count vitamin D and sunshine and time in nature and community. And, and in community, you could, you could capture you know, stress-free living and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So these are the four pillars of being human. I think that- Sleep, the, you missed sleep. sleep. I oh. wrote these down. I wrote these down. I wrote your five pillars yeah, yeah, down. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Sleep is one of them. Absolutely, sleep is the fifth one. And sleep is so huge, so huge. It's actually the one thing that I uh, sacrifice the least. I mean, I did eat some weird foods over Thanksgiving weekend because I was traveling. And I, yeah, and I mean, I mean, I did have more allergies and I didn't feel great, <laughs> but I didn't sacrifice sleep. I never sacrificed sleep, huge, huge. But these five pillars of being human, they're also the five things that you can't hack. You can't cheat nature in these things. And I, I want someone to prove me wrong because there's a lot of ways we've hacked nature recently. We have airplanes and we, you know, we fly across <laughs> the world and we have, so many cool things and iPhones and amazing gadgets, but you can't hack nature in these five things yet. So many people try and I think mm -hmm. they, they always fail. And it's like a lot of our problems are stem from this and yeah. And, and like, okay, the example, you, I don't think there will ever be a pill that you could take 
So you sleep four hours, but it's like you got eight hours of sleep because you took the pill. No, I don't think that is possible. Prove me wrong. I just absolutely do not think that's possible. And I think one of the interesting things is so many times when we talk about hacking them, we're actually just talking about getting back to the ancestral space of them. Like when we're talking about hacking sleep, we're talking about viewing morning sunrise and getting getting full light in your eyes, or we're talking about sleeping in a very, very dark room. Or yeah, yeah. Well, that's the solution. So okay, there's two ways of of saying hacking. So I'm saying what you can't hack is a workaround that a pill that will just get you that sleep mm -hmm. you can quote hack well i call it okay i hate the term biohacking i call it ancestral uh. hacking right so ancestral hacking is exactly what you're saying it's using ancestral methods to get to yeah to to have a better way of doing things right it's, it's looking to the past so it's like what are those doing what are it's just mimicking how we used to live so that's why they work but like for exercise you can't there's never going to be a machine that exercises for you. The whole thing is you have to do the exercise. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense that you can't do the weightlifting for you. Right? So that's, and I think that's with food, you're never going to make a synthetic meat that's better than real meat. Real meat is a miracle, right? It, it, yes. It's like animals that co evolved on these grasses for millions of years that can feed us the perfect nutrition. You cannot hack that. I don't care what you say is in it and the macros and what else i interviewed dr St stefan von vliet who's so amazing. did i okay, yeah good. he's incredible so he's getting into this the tens of thousands of secondary compounds you cannot mimic that there's no. absolutely no way and i i call it like alchemy it's like you're basically trying to do alchemy these the powers that be they're trying to create gold out of lead it's never going to work it's impossible to do you can't create a food that's better than red meat that's raised on a diverse diet. You're never gonna get the secondary compound. It's like physically impossible with the universe. It's like, how are you gonna get all these compounds in there without having e either the same amount of energy or more to get them there? Exactly. And that's the, that the same amount of energy or more. I want to tease that out. I don't know if you've ever read. Um, there's a gentleman in Kansas named Wes Jackson. He wrote Consulting the Genius of the Place and Becoming Native to This Place. It's kind of a Wendell Berry contemporary. Mm -hmm. um, and he developed actually a perennial cereal grain, speaking of grains, called Kernza. And he has this full idea of a sunshine study where you look at the energy inputs of of everything. So if you look at the energy inputs of a cr tractor, how much did it take to mine the steel? Or how much gas did it take for the steel lobbyists to drive around and that we can go mm -hmm. out further and further? And I think when we're talking about food, we can't create these secondary compounds in, a, in an impossible burger without using more energy than it took to just create them in nature in this perfect space. And I think it goes back to echo something that really struck me in this conversation. You can't skip a step. Yeah. People try to skip the step. They try to make money. It's also, yes, I love Wendell Berry, uh, Gabe Brown, you know, mm -hmm. read his books. I love all these people. Uh, David Montgomery. If you've read oh, Dirt yeah. Soil. Yeah, he was on the pod. Him and Ann Bickley were on the podcast a couple of, a couple of months ago amazing and so they t basically a lot of their stuff can be summed up as it's it's kicking the can down the road it's basically a short-term thinking and so we think it's better like you're saying we can use a tractor and we think it's better but what you're doing is kicking the can down the road as in either well and or not even look understanding the full impact of what you're doing and it, it's, it's like we would just especially in the, when we first came to america and we just would destroy the soil and move on you know what i mean or or it's just yeah. these things these repercussions are going to happen later and we don't know it yet and we're not factoring that in the cost i guess that's what the the big message of these guys are saying is that yeah it seems like monocropping is good and that we're getting a good deal but we're not like cosmically it's impossible to do better than nature so all we're doing is not seeing these repercussions for 30 years down the road and you know we're, we're seeing them now now the soil is depleted you know, it's turning to dust, all that stuff. Which we knew. I mean, the Dust Bowl happened and we, we knew this. And I think that one of the failings of where we are as humans is this sort of reductionist Newtonian or Cartesian 
ultra reductive view of things that really keeps us from seeing that long term vision. And I also think that we're limited by human time scale, that we have this idea of it, things only happening in 50 to 100 year spurts mm -hmm. without seeing the the full picture of what it means for a thousand years or 5,000 years or a hundred thousand years. Well, that's another limitation back to like being human and, and how this all works. And if it's human nature, it's like there is a limit on what we can grasp. And I don't think humans are good at thinking our brains just aren't set up to think on a thousand year scale. No. So there, so, but it, it's interesting because it used to work. We didn't need that type of thinking to survive and thrive throughout history. Right, because we could think, I mean, we, we kind of had some long-term thinking. I think we obviously didn't hunt every single antelope till they were dead, because we realized, oh wait, we need more antelope. <laughs> like we can't <laughs> kill them all. And so I think we did have some of this long-term thinking, but it wasn't like we had to think on thousand year scales and it worked, but it's like our modern society now doesn't work if we don't think on those long-term scales. And I think delayed gratification is a huge concept of mine that I love, not of mine, but it's something that I love <laughs> because I think how I've done some things that I, uh, that I'm proud of are because of my long-term thinking, right? I think a lot of success is from, and, and I mean, that's the whole point of the study, right? The marshmallow experiment is the kids that didn't eat the marshmallows had the, and that had the delayed gratification had more success in life. And that's kind of yeah uh i think how maybe i don't know which side i'm on this on, on you're, you're asking about human nature you know like are we set up for this or not and and some people are more set up for delayed gratification and sometimes it's against our human nature though like i, I think i think a lot of the problems is and then the powers that be in the corporate systems prey on the lack of long-term thinking they prey on the, the immediate gratification <laughs> because most humans want the immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I still haven't figured out my stance on this because it's like all the modern society is set up around immediate gratification. And so obviously that's being exploited and obviously that must be some sort of human shortcoming, <laughs> you know? Well, I, you know, I'm curious and, and you might know more about this than me, but when you look at dopamine, I think a lot of it is, is set up to serve some of these circuits that are hardwired from a hunter gatherer setting, right? Like dopamine is the space where as we pass a shrub covered in delicious sugary berries in late August, and it's an unexpected reward, those dopamine circuits fire so that we can remember, oh, at this time of year in this place, mm -hmm. I found a food that, that will help get me through winter. And all of a sudden, we've set up society around something that was hardwired into our brain and the way that we think as humans, but it can be exploited. And I think that the human organism is incredible and that we're capable of looking at that and saying, okay, this is how I'm responding and I don't want to do that anymore. How do I begin to shift this for myself? Or how do I begin to shift into more long-term thinking? You know what I was just thinking? I think maybe the people listening, the, my crowd here in Austin, the, the crowd that I know, the great people like Tara Couture, <laughs> maybe these are the people that just have that delayed gratification that somehow mm. we've popped out of the matrix or popped out of our human immediate gratification, dopamine world, and have been able to just think a little more long term. <laughs> and maybe that's a big difference. It's like that family friend that I mentioned just c cannot have that long term thinking. He cannot think I want to be around for my grandchild who was just born. And he wants to, he loves that little guy. And they had such a good time seeing him this weekend. But he still is eating the pop tarts. <laughs> You know, it's like, but then some people have, have just been, we've popped out of the matrix into long-term thinking. And yeah. I think that's what all the people I know have. They have the delayed gratification. That's interesting. Yeah. That's really How interesting. And 
I think that's a good question. And I think how much of it is nature and how much of it is nurture, because I think it behooves from an evolutionary standpoint for there to be members of a group that think long term and members of a group that think short term. Mm. We need both within the context, but they need to be certainly in a different balance than they're in now. But I I think that's an, Mm, is it delayed gratification? Maybe. So I like Dunbar's number, right? 150 people is what humans are supposedly the the limit of how many people we can hold in our social circles and, and, you know, actually know and interact with. And that's supposedly, you know, different size tribes. I, I mean, some could have been 50, some could have been a couple hundred. But it kind of revolved around that for all the history. So I think one of the major problems maybe with society at large, if you really, really zoom out, is we're just not meant to live beyond 150 people. And so that that when you're saying short-term thinking, I think if we did live in, say, a, we'll just call it 100, band of 100 people, then maybe we could do thrive and do amazing with some short-term thinkers, some long-term thinkers, some you know, great hunters, some great gatherers, so, you know, all this stuff and it yeah. just works. And when you go beyond that and all the problems start happening and Egyptian pharaohs to peasants and nowadays, and I guess uh, what, what being human is about, it's finding your tribe of 50 to 150 <laughs> people again. And then you can have more of that delayed gratification and some of that short term thinking, but it would, would work better. And maybe, yeah, that's tied into the people that I'm seeing that have success have created their own tribes, right, within society. And I think that's kind of my main goal. You mentioned the Sapien Center. That's here in Austin. It's basically just a community center. It's like a hub. It's just a place Mm -hmm. for us to be and get together and make our new tribe so we can still have our normal society and we can still exist in it, but we kind of have opted out while still being in society. And I think it works. It's actually great. I mean, I don't go out to eat. It's you know what I mean. I'm I'm living here. I live near downtown Austin. I'm in the thick of things, but I just don't go out. People are like, where do you go out to eat? I'm like, I don't know. I don't go out to eat. <laughs> I just make my own food. Like I don't need. Yeah. I, I have no interest in going out to eat. And this is another little side point. I try to explain to people, you can't use willpower to change and, and just constantly rely on this willpower of like, oh man, I want McDonald's so bad, but I'm not gonna do it. That's not gonna work. But what? when you change your thinking, when you don't want the McDonald's, then you're not using willpower, then it works, right? Mm-hmm. There's a huge difference. Some, so many people try to white knuckle their way through diets and cut calories and they're just like, it never works. That's why 98% of diets fail, whatever the statistic is. Why it works for people I know, is because we don't want those foods anymore. Going to McDonald's is not appealing anymore. Then you don't have to use your willpower and then it's just great. It's not like I'm sitting here wishing I could go to some restaurant i have no interest in going to that restaurant hmm i'm i'm still thinking about the difference between willpower and changing your thinking and i think that there's something it's not just about what you don't want but it's about what you do want to go back to that idea that when you stop eating those foods or when you're you know when you're eating all these delicious animal foods and you're cooking all of your own meals and you feel great i know that a lot of what drives me not is the change in i want to feel good Mm-hmm. It it's huge. It's it's a longer term thing. Again, the long term thing. It doesn't happen overnight. Excuse me. And I didn't. It just didn't happen for me overnight. I remember nine years ago. I was trying to do all the hacks. You know, I'm like, oh, I could get like a keto bread or something. I don't know. I was like trying to just do all these different things. Doesn't work. You you gotta just. It's it is a long term. It's like you have to have the positive reinforcement of I feel better. You have to have mm-hmm. the negative reinforcement of. I yeah I don't I feel bad when I do this yeah. <laughs> and eventually it happens and yeah I mean I don't think it's gonna take anyone under a year I think we're talking about a year scale to do any of this stuff it's like it's not like you're gonna go from loving McDonald's to not having zero thoughts about going there in less than a year right it's definitely gonna take time but mm. it's worth it I, it's also okay community go back to community I think a huge factor of success is having that community around you because if this guy is just in Arkansas with everyone doing the same things around him he's never going to change I saw like little bits of change when we were around him or when he visited LA 
And then, and, and then that's what I actually chalk up a lot of my success to is I changed my community. It's like I got together with people around me that wanted to change our diet and lifestyle. And then it was second nature and it was supported by them and it was encouraged and it's completely different. Completely different ball game. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's why. Yeah. yeah. It, it is. Oh, actually, I had another thing about community I wanted to talk, talk about is the blue zones. I hate the blue zones because it's bogus and it's fake. And this guy, Dan Buettner, wrote a stupid book. And he basically <laughs> was like a veg you know, vegetarian type of person that went around the world. Oh, I don't know, seven or nine, nine, nine places to see what he wanted to see. Right. But mm -hmm. what he did find was that there was so many other factors to health and despite what they ate, like he, he tried to conclude that you should eat mostly plants from that whole thing. And a lot of people mm -hmm. try to conclude that what well, my conclusion was, my God, they, these people had very diverse diets and they, a lot of them were healthy despite other things they did because they had such great community and they had the yes. strong bonds and they still worked into their old age and they walked up and down the, the you know, the mountains to, to like get to their food source or, you know, their local market and that their, their diets were all different. And he, and actually my good friend, Mary Ruddick is a nutritionist and travels the world with me. And she took me to Africa. Actually, she helped set up the trip and she's been to a lot of these blue zones to debunk them and basically they're they're all like nose to tail animal food eating places like she went to Ikaria in Greece and they just they're eating everything from the animal and they're have amazing sense of community and they even they smoke and drink but despite having you know moderate alcohol and tobacco consumption they're doing great because they did all these other things correctly and you know community is so important and I guess the biggest themes I saw from the blue zones was the importance of community and stress-free and purpose and life and all that type of stuff. Yeah. I think, I think community is incredibly important and I love everything that you said. And I think that blue zone study, like to look at it through that lens that all of these people have really rich and robust communities and that that is conferring health as much as, as much as these wonderful animal food based diets, you know, that it is a constellation of things. And I think my husband and I talk a lot about this, that we have lost the town center, the church, you know, whatever it is that brings a diverse array of people together to support one another. Oh. Um, and it's actually one of the things I found the most in farming in this. I live in a very rural community and I depend on my relationship with my neighbors who think and eat and are different than me, but we have formed this tight knit community. It's I, I like the concept of third spaces and this is something I'm coming, trying to do with the Sapien Center. And this is, I just watched a video about it. it. It was so interesting to me that we used to have the third space. So the first, you know, it's a home, then it's your work and it's a third space. And it used to be a town center. It could have been a library. It could have been the town square. You know, there was mm -hmm. some of it. A lot of it was bars. Actually, now days it's only bars. Our, our only third yeah. spaces are bars, and wow. it's kind of the opposite of what it should be. It's a bunch of people, you know, short-term relationships and and people, whatever. It, it, it's not, it's not what it, <laughs> based around a poison. Yeah, yep. it's yep. not what uh, the third space should be. So I think we need to revive third spaces and there's many ways to do it. And it, um, yeah, I mean, it, what you said, you just getting together with your community, whether or not there is even a physical location or not, or, you know, but also, Oh, one thing with the blue zones too, whole foods was the, the, the through throughput, the vein, um, through line in that it's these people were eating mostly whole foods too. Right. It wasn't that they're, well, they were eating animal foods, but it's like, yes, they all had diverse diets. And the common theme was whole foods. <laughs> they weren't eating. It's not like he went around and they were like, oh, well, this one eats McDonald's and this one eats like boxes of pasta. No. <laughs> it's or like gluten-free bread. Yeah. There was no They're gluten -free bread. unadulterated whole yeah. foods. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, well, 
the community i hadn't heard the term third space and i this is I, this feels really critical to me because i think that community is such a big part and so i'm excited to see how sapien center evolves and and just what that brings to the community because i think it could really provide a benchmark for creating more of these third spaces in in other in other areas oh well we want to expand that's the whole idea is to go around the country so if anyone I, i'm taking notes on um you know anyone who contacts me where they live it seems to be kind of congregating around florida nashville colorado sort of mm -hmm. these i don't know why those areas i think they're i don't know people who are just interested in more healthy living i don't know yeah well, I think it's fantastic. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know that we're running, running up against eleven o'clock. Um, but it, I, and I, can I throw in one more thing? Yeah, yeah. It's it's like my little left of field from this conversation. I just want you to touch on because I love this so much, satiety, and it, it's a little bit out of what we've talked about. But I love listening to you talk about satiety through um, the work that you talk about with Ted Naiman, but also from Stefan Van Vliet and Fred Provenza. And mm -hmm. I, I think that this is an important I, just little nugget that I don't mm -hmm. want to leave on the table. Oh, yeah. I love satiety. It's so important. <laughs> and I'm glad you brought it up. And it, it does tie in a lot of things together. And I think it really helps people to think about this. It's, well, okay. Why do people overeat? Everyone's fat and sick and no one wants to be, right? No one wants to be fat and sick, yet somehow we're here. If it was simple as calories in, calories out, people would have been able to just eat fewer calories. So the question is, why do people eat too many calories or the wrong calories? And that comes back to satiety. And, and satiety is very tied into level of processing. And if you think about the satiety of a food, it's really a, the level of that it's been processed. And the more it's been processed, the worse the, the satiety is. So a good example, it's like a soda. Or, it's like mm -hmm. you a Dorito. less satiating than a soda. It's not like, I was like, oh, I had a soda six hours ago. I'm full. <laughs> you like, basically will probably get hungrier from it. Because if you just drank a soda, your blood sugar would go up, it'd come back down, and you'd probably be really hungry two and a half hours later. So satiety is everything, I think. It kind of is a common theme of all good diets. And it's, it's kind of why whole food diets are good because they're in their whole food matrix. And especially mm -hmm. when they include animal foods with proteins and fats that keep you full. And, and phytonutrients, secondary. And all the secondary compounds. It's, oh man, yes, I did talk to Fred Provenza as well. And mm -hmm. Stephon and all this stuff. And he studies it in animals. And I think we need to study it more in humans. And, and sure. how this is what keeps you full. There's a, new, there's a protein leverage hypothesis, which me and Dr. Ted Naiman are, are all about, and I read the books, and you know, there's these two researchers, Robin Heimer and Simpson, and uh, I think they're about 80% there. But basically they're saying our human, all organisms actually, they extend it to all organisms that eat until they reach a certain amount of protein. And if the food doesn't have enough protein in it, you're gonna still eat it until you get that amount of protein. It's a very elegant theory, and I think it holds. And I like to extend that to nutrient, like, like the nutrient leverage hypothesis, and I think, Fred Provenza has done some good stuff mm -hmm. uh, to, to show that, that, you know, organisms eat until they get a certain amount of nutrients and protein is a nutrient, right? So in yes. the film, we talk about the, we basically just talk about this concept in simple terms around nutrient to energy and that that's kind of what matters. And it's like, why are animal foods good? Why are whole foods good? Because they keep you satiated for the right amount of time. So you're not going to eat too much. And I know it's more complicated than that. You can get into like the microbiome and the gut and all these other problems. And if you're having additives and chemicals and, and pesticides, of course, these are all bad. But it's like half of it is satiety and half of it yeah. is just not having toxic foods. Yeah. And I think to, to kind of bring it home, I think that we need to be satiated with life too, right? Like community is part of feeling sated with your life and your purpose and your community, right? Like there's, there's, there's satiety in food. And I think it's incredibly important. I love hearing you talk about it. And just now thinking about it, I think there's satiety in other spaces. That's so good. That's so good. I'm going to have to use that now because <laughs> I have been talking about this. I interviewed a guy, Dr. Tro, who is an obesity medicine guy. He, he has, you know, just really good with helping people reverse their obesity because he himself is a doctor 
And he was like, I'm 250 pounds. Like, what is going on? Lost like 80 pounds, normal weight, looks great for years, held it up. And what he saw in his clinic, big, he has a big obesity clinic. 75% of the people had traumatic past, childhood issues, childhood mm -hmm. trauma, sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. These are the people that are coming in who are overbeat, overweight and obese because they have a hole in their heart and they are not satiated mentally. And a yes. lot of people eat because they're sad, they're depressed, they're bored even. Mm -hmm. they, these are holes in their life. Wow, that's so good. It, it's kind of the unifying theory of everything is that if you aren't satiated in these human aspects of life, right, which is community and proper nutrition, then you're gonna be looking for, you know, more. Yeah. And more is usually processed food. <laughs> yeah. And in or some ways alcohol. processed life. Like I would I would argue that virtual reality, that some of these things are just hyper palatable, hyper processed, you know, mimicries of life, a video game, a Netflix series, uh whatever. That you're 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 looking for satiety but you're not going to find it in the television or in your can of Pringles, whatever it is. So true. I'm so against all like the metaverse stuff and even alcohol and drugs. Again, people yeah. know that that's, it's pretty well known that those are people, you know, who are unhappy with life and looking yeah. for more. And what's also great is I've noticed a lot of people reach out to me saying that they stopped drinking once they changed their diet. It's really interesting. They just didn't have as, as much, been interested anymore and that's what i found around austin too it's yeah like, no none of these people no, no, we don't drink around here the saving center is great because it's just it's a place to go that's not a bar and it's not about alcohol and it's just about community i love it well if people want to find out more about how to become more satiated as a human and what it means mm -hmm. to be human where can they find you and when does food lies come out we are date. working on it constantly. I, I think it's actually going to be in the summer. So we, we really got to finish it. Turn into a six part series now. So, but it's, it's going to be really good. Go to the food lies YouTube channel, watch the intro. It's a three and a half minute intro that we it's awesome. made. Thank you. Yes. We spent a lot of time on it. it and it shows. Thank you. And, and food lies on Instagram. That's where I do most of my stuff. Just go to the food lies on any social media platform, whether it be, you know, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I'm there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having this conversation. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited for everybody to hear it and just grateful for your time. Well, thank you, Kate. It was fun. Yeah. Um. <laughs>